Welcome to Watercolor Basics. This class will walk you through the basics of how watercolor works. So nothing beats in-person instruction with a teacher who really understands this medium. Um, having somebody who can watch how you paint is really the best way to create good habits from the start. But sometimes that's just not feasible for any number of reasons. So I'm going to do my best here to walk you through what you want to be doing. Watercolor can feel very frustrating. If you take your time as a beginner to really understand what's happening and how this works, you'll have a much easier time problem solving as you progress. And remember, anytime you're learning something new, be patient with yourself. Be your own best friend, encourage yourself, practice positive self-talk. Don't fall into the trap of overly negative criticism and judgment. Give yourself time to figure this out. It's a good idea to come back and review this material, this particular class, uh, regularly. There's a lot that you're going to be trying to remember, um, and it's so easy for us to move along to more challenging things that feel more like what we want to be doing, and then we easily forget some of those basics that we should always have in mind. So we're going to start with controlling variables. Um, watercolor is notorious for being challenging to control. The trick is learning to control the variables for a more predictable outcome. We have water, paint, and this sponge. This sponge is the key. You want a large kitchen sponge, not a natural sponge or the kind for drywall or tile work. You need to fully wet your sponge and really wring it out all the way so there's no, no drips that will come out of it. When I dunk my brush in the water and give it a swish, I'm fully saturating my brush. I can repeat this with consistent outcome. So this is a variable I can control, and this is a variable I can control. So when you're painting often, this saturated brush is too much water, which is where the sponge comes in. Uh, it can take, I can take my saturated brush, and I can briefly set it against the sponge to take off the drips, and I still have a pretty wet sponge. I can set it down a few more times to take off more water. And each time I'm touching the sponge or the brush to the sponge, I'm taking off more water. If I need a dry brush, I can just really let the water soak off into the sponge. Uh, with this, you can really control just how much water you have on your brush. Um, many people choose to use paper towel instead of the sponge, which can also work, um, but paper towels tend to remove so much water that you have a, a less nuanced range of options. Um, I've seen people wet their paper towel and, and that might work a little bit better if that's what you have. Um, but I, I really do recommend the sponge. Um, it's a little easier to control in, in my opinion. So. Pause this video here and take a minute to try this out. So I want you to saturate your brush and look at how wet that looks. Look at the sheen on the brush and look at how that sheen changes each time you set your brush down on your sponge. Remembering that the sponge was fully wet and then wrung out all the way. And just kind of get a sense for what that looks like for now. This trick for controlling water is going to help us in two places. First, we can control how much water we bring to our palette. If you keep bringing a saturated brush to your palette, you'll dilute your paints. The sponge is the in-between step to let you control how much water you bring to your palette. So let's stay, say I want a, a medium dark blue. I'm going to give my brush a good swish, tap it to the sponge so I don't fully or don't bring so much water over to my palette that I'm going to uh, dilute my paints. I'm going to pick up some blue, spread it out. Maybe I want a little bit more. I'm going to wet my brush again because my, my paints are a little bit dry this morning. Okay, so I've got a little, a little puddle of blue here. So if, if what I'm looking at here in my palette when your two paints are squirted out, this is the darkest that you can get any of those colors to be. Um, as we add water, we're going to make those values, the lightness or darkness is the value, we're going to make those values lighter. Uh, if you bring a lot of water into your palette, um, you can end up diluting the values and it can be a little bit harder to get those dark values to come through. Um, so that's why the, the sponge is the in-between step is important. Um, so let's say I want this blue a little bit lighter. I'm going to add more water. And as you're learning, you know, you can go a little too far. Maybe it gets too light. You can come back over to your paint, pick up some more paint and get your value darker again, wherever you want to be in there. 
So when I find something that I'm happy with, I'm ready to paint. But remember how I was using that sponge to go between water before bringing this over? I'm gonna set it down a couple times before I pick up more paint. Uh, if I bring lots of water, I'm gonna have a hard time getting this darker if I wanted it darker. If I bring lots of water, um, you can do that, end up with a puddle in here, which is fine if you're working light, but again, if you end up wanting to get darker, you're gonna have trouble getting there. But you can always come back to the sponge, let your brush soak up some of that extra water, take it off the brush with your sponge, and then you're, you're back in business here. Um, so once we have this mixed, if we're gonna go paint with this, if I'm painting a small shape, I don't want a really wet, drippy brush. This is so wet, it's just dripping paint. If I try to do something small, it's gonna flood my, my shape. So this is the second place where the sponge is really helpful. You're gonna wanna mix a nice big puddle of paint pretty much all the time um, so that you have what you need to fill the area that you're working and paint doesn't go as far as you think it's gonna go. You'll run out, so you always wanna mix a little bit extra. But if I'm painting a small shape and I don't want this drippy brush, I can go to my sponge, even though it has paint on it, that's fine. I can take a little bit of that paint off and now I'm ready to make my shape on my paper. Um, but before we actually bring brush to paper, let's think about what happens when we do that. So, um, say this is a side view of your piece of paper. So when you make a stroke of paint, you're creating a bubble of water with pigment suspended in it. For a lot of what you paint, for most of what you paint, you're gonna be looking for kind of a medium amount of water. So you have a nice fluid application. If you're painting with a very wet brush, you might end up with a bubble that looks something like that. Again, with pigment bits floating around in there. And if you're painting with a very dry brush, it might look something more like that. So what's the difference and why does it matter? Um, for different reasons, you might want each of these in different places. As a beginner, I'm gonna suggest that we start here in the medium area because that's the hardest. Um, having a very thick puddle, a very deep puddle, tall puddle, um, means that you have more pigment overall. So if what you thought you were going to get is what you're looking at when you spread your paint out. If you paint really wet, what you're going to get is a little bit darker because there's more pigment in there, which is gonna pull into the paper and you'll overall have more pigment, which will make it look darker. The other thing that happens is, depending on your working conditions, um, if you don't have a breeze, if it's not hot out, uh, things are gonna dry a little bit slower. If this big tall bubble dries slowly, these pigments have time to follow gravity and float to the side, and you might get a shape that ends up with a dark outline around it. That can be a cool effect, but it's easy, especially as a beginner, to get that effect without intending to, and it can be really frustrating then to try to get rid of those darker lines. It's possible to do, for sure, um, but it's a little bit frustrating, so that, that medium place is a little bit better for that. And the downside with working dry, um, it feels easier to control in some ways, but remember watercolor is transparent and it dries. So when this dries, our pigment is laying on the paper. If we put another stroke next to it, if this is pretty dry, it's gonna to start to dry as soon as you put it down. So by the time you pick up your next stroke of next uh, batch of paint to make your next stroke, this might have dried enough that what happens here ends up being two layers of paint. And if you have two layers of paint, it's going to look darker because it's transparent. So this place that we're wanting to work, this medium application of paint and water, medium wet, um, the benefit here, and we'll get into this uh, when we talk about values um, in, an, in another lesson, uh, when you paint multiple strokes that are the same, if you learn how to control this, what happens when you paint these strokes, this will still be wet when you paint this stroke, which is still wet when you paint this one, and where they overlap, the, the water will kind of fill in through here and your pigments will mix and this whole area will mix more evenly. But if you end up wanting to do a color change or a value change in between, you'll keep what you originally had and where they overlap, they will mingle and blend together. 
So you can get these neat effects with changing color or changing value and you still have what you wanted, say red, yellow, blue, but we might get a little bit of orange and might get a little bit of green in between those, which might be what you're looking for. Um, so and that's getting kind of complicated. We'll get into this much more in future lessons. Um, but for now, trust me, try to learn how to work in that, that medium wet area. Um, let's see. So let's, let's just take a pause here and practice mixing some paint um, and making brush strokes that are very wet, very dry, and in the middle. So what I want you to do for that is pick up paint, get a nice, really see how much water I have I'm pushing around. We're not going to do a whole lot with this. I don't want you to fill your page or anything. Just get a little bit of a sense for this. <clears throat> Okay, so I have a good puddle here. You see all this water I'm pushing around? Get yourself a nice, good puddle. And then let's go very wet first since you're already here. So really soaking up in your brush. You should be able to get some drips to come off your brush if you're wet enough here. Paint yourself a brush stroke and look at what happens. See this puddle in here that's moving around? And then let's come back. So you're saturating your brush again in your puddle. And let's tap the sponge a couple of times and then do a stroke. See the difference? There was a little bit extra at the end, but it kind of soaked in pretty quick. And let's come back yet again, resaturate the brush. So we're starting in the same place. And now this time, really set your brush, let it get pretty dry. And see the difference there, what I'm getting with this. Um, the, the dry has this kind of scratchy look to it because the brush is skimming over the surface, there's not enough water to, um, it's not fluid enough to float into the gaps between the texture of the paper. Um, and you can kind of see on this darker one, how we're, it's, well, it looks darker because it's thicker. Remember, I was pulling from the same puddle each time, right? So the value of my paint that I'm starting with is the same. This is what happens when we have a really thick puddle that we're painting, is it looks darker because there's more pigment in there. And as that pulls in, this particular pigment is a granulating pigment. You can see it's kind of separating out and getting this kind of neat texture to it. Maybe you can see that. Maybe this isn't focusing very well. Um, but it's also darker in a couple spots where it got a little extra puddly. That might be exactly the look you're going for sometimes. This might be the look you're going for sometimes. Either, either of those are pretty easy to get to um, just because they're extremes. I mean, you mix a big wet puddle and paint straight from there easily. You can dry your brush all the way off easily. Finding that middle ground and learning how to control that, that middle area consistently is really a challenge. So that's where I'm going to have a start um, because that's going to help you long term. So let's take a pause here and practice. Mix out a little puddle of paint and practice very wet, very dry, and somewhere in the middle and kind of get a sense for what it feels like. Do more than just a few strokes, but you don't need to fill your page. So we're going to practice painting a few things. Um, we're going to start by working, like I said, in just one color. Uh, all of what I've said so far is plenty to wrap your head around. So it's really best to limit how much you're trying to practice all at once. Starting small, having successes, and then building over time will help you enjoy the process and want to keep painting. Um, you know, if you try to do everything at once, you're more likely to feel overwhelmed and decide that you can't do this. Anyone can do this. It just takes practice and some good instruction. If you, you know, wanted to learn to write a novel, you wouldn't start by diving into page one and expecting yourself to be successful. You'd maybe like read some tutorials or take a class. You'd practice writing exercises, brainstorming outline. You'd separate out some pieces to practice like character development and storyline. And you know, the same thing is true here. We're gonna start small, get some practice and build gradually. We'll get on to color later. Um, so to start, we're gonna explore what it feels like to put paint to paper and try to control some shapes. So always remember to use your sponge appropriately. Really slow down here as you're figuring this out so that you can think about what you're actually making. How much paint did you make into a puddle? How much are you taking off with your sponge? What are you doing here before you come to the paper? This is really crucial to what's going to happen here. And the better you understand this, the better success you'll have here. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to get myself just a little bit more of a puddle. I started to dry a bit during that pause. Maybe I'll go a little bit darker. So the first thing I want to talk about is how you hold your brush. And um, you can get different looks, different ways to use your brush. You know, people are creative. We can come with all kinds of different things to do. So I'm just going to give you a couple basic guidelines. Uh, when you get on to actual painting somewhere down the road, um, use your imagination. You, you can do all kinds of things to manipulate your brush to get it to do what you want it to do. The basics, though, to think about is um, looking at how the brush works. Um, this is going to matter more when we get into larger shapes, um, but let's just mention it now first anyways. So you've got the tip of your brush, and if you have a good brush, if you watched my, my video on choosing good materials, you want a, a nice fine point to your brush. Um, if you have a good brush with a nice tip that can make a nice fine line, that's good. And then you've got the body of your brush, which holds a reservoir of paint that allows for that fluid stroke. As you paint, that reservoir dries out. If your shape isn't very big, you just come back and pick up some more paint, go back into the same area and keep going, and it works just great. If you keep doing this, however, you hit a point where the body of your brush is so dry that you can't get a fluid application even when you're coming in here. You're trying to resaturate your brush from your puddle, and there's a point where you it just can't do it. Um, so just like a sponge, if a sponge is dry, it doesn't soak up water. A wet wrung out sponge does soak up water. So what you'll do if you're doing larger shapes, and I'll say this again when we get to that, if you're doing larger areas, you can probably come back into this puddle a couple of times and be fine to just keep going. But you'll hit a point where what you really want to do is give your brush a good swish in the water so it's all saturated. And you're going to take off some of that water till you're kind of a medium level of, of wetness on your brush and then come back because now what you've done is re-wet that internal sponge so it can pick up more pigment again and you're good to go and keep painting. This is another reason that you always want to mix an extra large puddle of paint, especially when you're doing large shapes, because when you have to come and resaturate that brush, you are going to lose a little bit of paint in your water. You're going to take a little bit off with your sponge as you're controlling this. Um, it's not you know, this is not a big economic uh, issue here. You're not going to waste a ton of money buying paint that's going to go to your sponge and water, but some some does. Um, so keeping that in mind um, for future. First, let's go back and look at how we're going to hold the brush and our lines. So I made my nice puddle and I'm going to take some off so I can work on doing a more controlled line. With this point of the brush, you can see and control where that part of your brush goes, right? If I hold my brush angled sideways like this, as many of us do when we're sitting down, we're used to this, this is how we hold pencils, the width of my line is completely pressure dependent. If I push harder, I'm going to get a wider line. If I push less hard, I'm going to get a finer line. Until you've spent a lot of time painting, it's pretty tough to control that and consistently get the same width of line. That's hard for a lot of us to do. Um, and if you're younger, um, if you're still a kiddo, or if you help kids paint, um, this is especially challenging because the, the, the uh, muscle development just isn't quite there to have that control yet. So what do we do? Look at how you hold your brush. If I change and hold my brush more vertically, I could drag a line, oops, drag the line behind me. That's much easier control. If I push harder, I'll get a wider line. But if your hand is resting on the table and you touch your brush down and you drag, it's a little bit easier to control what you're going to get. When we get to shapes, there's a trick that I'll show you. But for lines, what I want you to spend a little time practicing is different ways to hold your brush and what happens when you do. Also, if you want a fine line, looking at the shape of that brush, if I'm working at angle, more of the brush is going to be hitting the surface of the paper. So even with a very light touch, I'm not going to get a super fine line. But if I go straight vertical, I can use a really light touch and get a much finer line because I'm only getting those back bristles or, or tip bristles touching the paper and they're narrower up there. Okay, so let's take a pause here. Um, Practice making some lines, get a sense for your brush, and start with a nice big puddle. Remember how much paint is on your paper. If you go to do these shapes, you're trying to do a small line, and you just see this really wet, 
well, I guess it won't drip, really wet, wet puddle, see how much darker that is. Really look at what happens when you put your paint, your brush to the paper and make sure you're hitting something in between. Not super dry, not, not this dry scratchy, not this wet and drippy, but somewhere in the middle. Okay, take a minute and practice that. Okay, so now for some shapes, how you control the edge and fill them in. Um, let's start by drawing some uneven, strange looking shapes, amoebas maybe. <laughs> it could be whatever you want it to be for a shape, does not matter. <clears throat> These are relatively small shapes. We're gonna start here. Um, the thing with painting in watercolor, remember this is a transparent medium. So if you layer um, if you layer with the same amount of water while it's wet, you'll get a nice fluid filled in area. Remember how I was showing you with, with this. Um, if you allow parts to dry or start to dry, you can end up with a, a line showing or a darker, darker marks for your first under stroke and then where they overlap, it'll be darker yet. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, you don't want that usually. This is not a coloring book. So it's not like when you learn to color where you take your crayon and you go right up to the edge so you get a nice clean edge first and then you fill in the middle. If you do that, your edge, your shape will look like it has an outline to it, which sometimes might be what you want. Often it might not be what you want. So the trick is to think about your shapes, um, think about painting your shapes as, um, I don't know, I, I liken it to sort of drawing a curtain across the shape. We're gonna start on one side and work our way across, making it one cohesive whole shape that gets defined as we go. Uh, actually, you know what? Those shapes might be too small for you to see in the video. So I'm gonna do this a little bit larger so you can see what I'm doing. <clears throat> but I'm not gonna talk about larger shapes just yet. Um, I'm gonna come back and make sure I've got an ample puddle of paint ready to go. Now, I'm gonna pretend this was a smaller shape. If this is a smaller shape, this is gonna be way too much water to bring into this. So I'm gonna need to take a little bit off with my sponge. And I'm gonna think about where I want to start here. If I have to paint this as a whole, um, I find it easier to start with a smaller corner and work my way across. So instead of going from down here to the top, this is one big wide area. For me, it feels easier to start from the side, but you can experiment with this and see what works for you. So what we're gonna do, if we wanted to have a really carefully controlled edge on this shape, we want to be pointing the tip of the brush into that pencil line. So I'm gonna start here and you can, oops, that's a lot wet. Watch what you're doing. If you're getting a big puddle, you probably need to take some off. This is about the size of puddle I would want to have that I'm pushing around. Now I'm starting to outline, but very quickly, I'm gonna come back over and combine this into one shape. And notice I'm changing the angle of my hand so I can push the tip of my brush into my shape, but I gotta keep pulling this over. Now it's starting to look dry. I've gotta pick up some more paint. So I'm going to keep doing the same thing, point my brush into the pencil line, come back and unify the shape, get some more paint. I want to keep this little wet bead kind of that I'm pushing around. Um, think of that as the active edge of your paint. I'm going to give my brush a swish here because unfortunately I made this into a large shape, so now I'm handling it differently than I wanted to demonstrate, and that's way too much water. Um, this, this active edge, this bead that you're pushing around, is very important. If you have that, that means you're getting a nice fluid application. If you don't have that, you're probably working a little bit too dry, and if your puddle is too big, you're gonna get a little bit what I'm getting here. I'm trying to show you this puddle, so I'm letting it go a little bit bigger than I normally would, or this bead at the front. Um, and because of that, I'm getting a little bit of an uneven application of paint here. I'll do another smaller one to show you again. You can turn your paper. Does not matter if it's 
an apple or a landscape or a face you can or a portrait you can absolutely turn your paper now look at that big dark spot here's our trick dry your brush off you set your brush back in there and it'll soak up that extra paint and that should just blend out in there so you see where I got a little bit darker in some areas? That's because I was trying to show you this as if it was a small shape, but really it was a big shape. So I will try, let's see if I can get this a little bit closer to the camera and we will try this on these smaller shapes. So I'm gonna give my brush a good swish again so that it's fully saturated. Okay, now I've gotta be careful to take off enough paint to get in one of these small shapes. I already went outside the line a little bit, kind of hard to hold it. <laughs> so notice I didn't go too far with that. That is almost too far, but this is a small shape and I can go quick enough. This will be okay. But you see how I'm bringing my shape, my paint across the shape, not outlining it first. Okay. And then again, I'm drying my brush to pick up the extra paint. Okay. So take a pause here and practice a couple smaller shapes. And we're gonna do one more large shape um, so I can actually talk through what I want you to think through when you're doing a larger shape. So if I'm doing a larger shape, um, I both want to think about which way I'm working through here and depending how big it is, how wide it is, um, you will need more paint, but you have to balance how much paint's on your brush with how fast you're gonna be able to move through an area. So you don't end up with some parts having that, that thick, tall bubble, very wet bubble of water, and some areas ending up drier. You want to have consistency through the whole thing. So just because it's a larger shape does not mean I necessarily want to start with a saturated brush. If I was doing a full sheet of paper and I'm doing the, the background, I might go with a saturated brush if I'm going to fill in a really large area. But something like this, I don't want to because what will happen is it'll start out really thick and wet on this side. And as I pull it over, it'll start to dry and I'll go from darker to lighter without meaning to. So I'm still going to come over to my, to my sponge take a little bit of paint off and I'm watching the size of this bead that's a little bit big unless I can keep that same amount through the whole thing which I don't think I can because we're going for consistency here you want to make sure it's something controllable so notice how I'm unifying my shape not just outlining pick up a little bit more paint again it's probably a little too wet so I'm gonna take a little bit off with that sponge As tempting as it is to outline, don't do it. Now here, I'm gonna to have to be a little careful. I'm gonna turn my paper so I can, oops, do you see how dark that got? That's very wet. I forgot to hit my sponge enough first. So before I bring that over to here, take a little off with the sponge so that these will meet up in the same place. Okay, uh, and I'm going to show you something, if I can remember before I finish this, um, so that if you get some weird things happening, you know what, what went wrong. Oh, that got way too dry. So that means I need to rinse my brush, give it a good swish, take the extra water off, come to my puddle, pick some more paint up, and look how I'm running out of paint already. That's too wet. Move my paper so I can push the tip of the brush into that edge. You can see right here where I came in too wet. I'll explain what happened there in just a minute. Talking and painting does not work very well for my brain, which is great because it makes weird it makes me do things I don't intend to do just like that. And then I can show you what happened or what that's from uh, and or sometimes down the road, how to fix it. So what happens when, when that's what we get? Here's what's going on. Let's go this way. Here was my piece of paper and I was working with this amount of water and then I came in with a too wet brush so I came in with this much water. Well it's water 
and water is going to follow gravity and these are going to equalize. So what happened is the water from this bubble pushed into the other. Now this bubble was actually the whole length of shape here. So really what happened is this whole big shape was here and I put more water down next to it. That more water kind of pushed into here and started overlapping this area so it looks darker because we got extra pigment in this area. That's kind of complicated. Um, I will get into more of that in future lessons. Um, if you watch when you're applying paint to your paper, if you really watch what's happening, if you see the paint start to move in or out of different shapes, it's because of how much water you have. If you have more water next to less water, more water is going to push into the less water. So if you were starting very wet and you paint dry next to it, the water is going to flow in as you're painting that next stroke. If you started with less water and you come in with more, it's going to flow into what you already painted. So if you really watch what's happening on your paper as you're painting, you'll be able to see that and kind of problem solve um, what you were maybe not quite getting right with your water and sponge balance first. So I'm going to take another pause here, let you practice some larger shapes. Okay, so again, remember as you're doing this, always make more paint than you think you're going to need. As you maybe saw there, practicing some of those larger shapes, um, as you fill in, that paint goes away. Also, what you have mixed is your puddle is starting to dry as soon as you mix it. It's, it's water, it's going to evaporate into the air. So as you're painting, just keep in mind, nice big puddle, even if you don't think you're going to need it. You probably will. And if you have a big mixing tray like I recommend, you can save this for another color you're going to mix later. Um, so it's not like you're wasting paint by making more than you actually need. You can end up using it. Okay, so this is the most basic stuff. Um, all of this was done on dry paper. Some artists prefer working on wet paper, um, which gives a different look. And you can combine working on wet and dry paper within the same painting. Um, there's lots of neat things to do both on dry or wet paper um, with a wetter or drier brush or somewhere in the middle. Um, but that's a little more advanced uh, and I feel it's easier if you understand working on dry paper first where you can really see what's happening um, with your water and again controlling those variables when you're just getting started is important. Um, so spend some time, make shapes and practice filling them in. If that feels boring, be creative. You can make abstract paintings as you practice, or you could do mini paintings of simple shapes that you could use for like gifts or greeting cards. Um, you could make little hearts for Valentine's Day. I've done that for my kids. Um, but pay close attention to how you're using your brush and your sponge. Build good habits now for noticing how much water you're bringing to your palette and how wet the paint is that you're bringing to your paper. Take it slow and be very conscious of your movements. Keep in mind that when you're starting out, you don't want your brush movements to look like those of probably any artist you've ever watched paint. Um, Bob Ross had years of experience to let him make these beautiful, quick and efficient movements. That speed comes with time and practice. So for now, keep it slow and intentional. Doing this now will bypass some of the typical struggles people run into. Um, and remember, this is all practice work. It's like playing scales while learning an instrument. You don't need to share it with anybody else. Uh, don't expect yourself to make a finished painting now. Give yourself the time to practice. Um, and remember, even when you get into doing finished paintings, every single painting is practice for the next. Every piece I create, I, I think every artist always for life, you're, you're learning, um, you're assessing, you're figuring things out. Even things that look like masterworks are practice on the road to the future. So be kind to yourself. Enjoy the process and happy painting.